Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. It's really great to see everybody in person. Um, to start the meeting off, I'm just going to pass it over to Dan from the Legion. We're really excited to be here and really appreciative for all the work he did to make sure we could meet safely inside. So he's just going to go over a few notes. For Take sure. Away. I'll leave you with the sanitized mic and I'll just uh, use my force's voice. Uh, welcome Rotarians, it's wonderful to have you here uh, back at the Legion, so thank you ever so much for joining us. When Amanda emailed me saying you guys were looking for a place, uh, we did everything we could to make sure that that happened uh, in, in just a few days. So we're so excited about having you guys here on a regular basis, so welcome to the Legion, first of all. Thank you. Um, you'll notice there are some big changes, of course, to uh, the Legion, and I'm not just talking about the fact that I've grown a beard. Very <laughs> um, dashing, Dan. Yeah, there you go. Um, a few different things, obviously, because of adapting to the new normal, so I just wanted to go over those with you uh, just briefly. Uh, as you know, anyone who has uh, been out of the country, um, we ask you not to come down to Legion. Anyone who is experiencing COVID-like symptoms, we'd ask you to please refrain from uh, coming to the Legion as well. And anyone who has had um, close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19, we have a very vulnerable population, of course, of our membership that come down to the Legion. So we just ask you to stay away if you're feeling ill. Um, the tables there, on the tables you'll see a little card and that's green for sanitized and red for uh, needs to be cleaned. If you wouldn't mind, everyone, as soon as you sit down, just flipping that over to the red side, and then that way we know which tables have been sanitized and which tables need to be sanitized for our membership, okay? And you're more than welcome to move around, but if you leave the table, do please uh, pop your mask on, if you don't mind, and try and maintain social distancing. Uh, we are asking that one person of each gender, please, uh, use the bathroom at a time, okay? Uh, so if you see someone else in there, just patiently wait for them to come out. Uh, Amanda's got the sign-in sheet for you, so please make sure that you sign in, both for rotary purposes and also for us, just in case we need to get in contact with you. Uh, and then just one more thing, and that is, um, have a wonderful meeting today. We would ask that you do vacate the premises by 1.30. Uh, and the big reason for that is we open to the general public at 2, and our staff need to be able to sanitize the tables and sanitize everything ready for general public and membership coming in. Uh, next week, or next time you're here, folks, um, what we will do is we'll actually get you to park in this back parking lot here, and we'll open up and you can come straight in through the back. Okay, so in the case that we have another rental upstairs or anyone else in here, you're all coming in and, and going out and there's no uh, coming in and going out at the same time. All right, and once again, thank you ever so much for being here and for adhering to those rules, you know, uh, and adjusting to the new normal. And um, again, welcome to the Legion. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much. We really, really appreciate it. So, in true Rotary fashion, let's start our meeting with O Canada. Jim, if you don't mind leading us. <laughs> o Canada, our home and native land, true patron love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see the true north strong and free from far and wide O oh Canada we stand on guard for thee God keep our land glorious and free O oh Canada we stand on guard for thee O oh stand on guard for thee. That was one of our better ones, I think. <laughs> uh, please join me in a toast uh, to the Queen, to Canada, to Rotary, and in particular this Rotary Club. Cheers. 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 Cheers.
And for those that know it, uh, please join me in Rotary Grace. Mm -hmm. O Lord, giver of all good, we thank thee for our daily food. We make rotary friends in rotary ways. Help us to serve thee for all our days. Amen. Amazing. So this is normally where we introduce. You can sit now. Thank you. Uh, this is normally where we introduce our guests. Today we have two guests. We have our guest speaker Johnny Wade. Very excited for that. And his fabulous wife Andrea. Welcome, Welcome to our guests. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to eat during the meeting. Um, I'm just going to go through stuff pretty quickly just so we can get out of here on time for the Legion. I'd like to keep the schedule as much as possible. John couldn't be here today. But he asked me to do a little update for Bingo. So Bingo has been doing amazing. Last week, they brought in $4,000 in one week of Bingo. So we're getting winter numbers in the summer, which is pretty fantastic, especially considering... Bye, thank you so much. Um, considering uh, this is the only fundraiser we've really been able to do in the last while, so that's very promising. Um, for our community service committee and money that we can give out to the community. So, super exciting. Thank you everyone who's been covering shifts. We appreciate you. Next, I don't know, Britt, did Christine ask you to talk about the vote-in? No. Oh, okay. But, but I can. <laughs> Could you? Do you mind? So, it is scheduled for this Sunday. At this time, weather's looking a little bit iffy. So, I think on Friday, by the end of the day, Friday, we will make a call on whether we'll have it. And if it looks really miserable and rainy, then we're um, tentatively going to schedule it for the following Sunday and somehow tie it into the Terry Fox walk, run, jog. So you, we'll figure that out. But watch it for an email on Friday. Either it's live or it's not. Obviously, you can drive to my house. Can I have a show of hands of anyone that intends to vote if the weather's good? One, two, maybe. So we, I have limited docking space. The water is so high, we don't have a really long dock this year. So I can fit three or four boats after that, though. I'll need to make arrangements with John Swick at Queen's Cove if I need some slips. But so far, so good, that and so. Um, yeah, stay tuned, but take a look Friday. I mean, I'd love to have you Sunday in the rain, but please don't come. <laughs> okay. All right, stay tuned. That's Great, it. thank you so much again oh, for, oh, sorry. And it is, we are having, just because we want to be COVID friendly in prior years, often we've done potluck or what have you, just show up with, with drinks and a seat and we will, we have someone catering, so she'll be bringing in some snacky stuff for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you again so much for hosting. You're welcome to be great. Uh, I think we have 30 people signed up so far. So if you haven't signed up, please RSVP just for food numbers. We would greatly appreciate that as well. Um, next we have Jim. He's going to give us a little update on golf. I don't know if you've seen it, but here's some pictures of all the golf teams we had out to the golf tournament. Yeah. Thank you. Just in case you haven't looked at this, please have a look at this. Because <laughs> these are the folks that showed up uh, on our golf day, which was awesome. And uh, thanks to Amanda for, for organizing that part of it. Uh, we had about 52 golfers in, the, in a grand time, so it, yeah, it was, it was really fun. We took pictures of the first tee, it was good. Um, the other surprising part of it uh, was there were really no prizes except bragging rights. Um, and uh, I'll give you some details. There we go. There was a longest drive for the men and women. The men was won by Lee Clark, the women's by Kathy Bang King. Most of the people that won were from away. Marco Stevanovsky from, uh, I think, Huntsville won the uh, closest to the hole. And sadly, nobody won the hole in one. That was so annoying. There's only three people on the green. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and, and having said that, also, I'd like to extend great thanks to, to Jamie, who did heroics to get there to help uh, volunteer, uh, Bruce, Wanda, and Jason. Jason, thank you very much for coming out and assisting on the day. We, we didn't have a lot of requirement. We had a beautiful day, though. It was really good. And even though there was no request, really, for funds to be donated, we did raise $650 uh, from a number of sources. And thank you, Roger was one of them. And uh, I, just, I just think it was nice that people still kicked in a little money. We did put out all of our sponsor signs that, that we've ever had. On the, on the golf course, which I, I think was a nice gesture to others. And I'd like you to get your phones out now and put in um, August 25, 25th, 2021 at Brooklyn. will be our next outing. Hopefully we'll be a, a, a nicer uh, well, nicer situation than we're in right now. Okay? Uh, yeah, so there you go. Is that enough? Yeah. Thanks, Jim.
thanks again to Jim and the golf committee for you know shifting things so we could still have a great day. The weather was amazing. Oh, oh. I forgot. Brock Lavin's team shot a 63. Wow. There we go. I don't know golf. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> I was there, but I have no idea. Yes, <laughs> yes they were the lowest team. Great. Um, today we're just going to do happy bucks. Um, and just for the sake of COVID friendliness, if if you just want to put your money in one of those containers on your way out, that would be lovely. But if anyone has anything they're happy about that they'd like to share, looks like Jim's going to reach for his wallet there. I'll let Jim go first. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a happy 10, uh, mainly because even though we're in the middle of craziness, uh, I've, I've had the real pleasure of being able to be in Algonquin Park with some very, very interesting clients from Algonquin Outfitters. And I just spent three, three and a half days with this lovely family from Toronto. Both of the parents are doctors. One is the head of surgery at St. Michael's, and the other one is the head of research. And, and, I, it, and I have to tell you, it is such a pleasure to be able to sort of speak to folks that are so involved in, in, our, in our health and welfare. And uh, I just, I'm really totally happy, and I'm going out again Friday and again the following week. Um, so it's just, it's been a real delight, despite all the crap. <laughs> Britt, did you have? Yeah. I don't have a Tony, my wallet's empty. That's great. <laughs> I'm actually, it starts with two big fines, but we're not doing fines. Well, Can I tell you anyway? So last <laughs> night, we are, we've got bingo, and there's no one there to unlock the door for us. And you know we go live at 6:30. So I'd like to find Roma because at 6:25 she's showing me pictures on her phone. <laughs> Roma, we've got a situation. We need to get in the bingo room. So it was supposed to be John DeCarly, who's the other big fat fine, because he didn't know he was to be there. And but I called Gail Hunt at 6:25. She had us on the air by 6:39. She flew in from home. I think she might have been wearing her pajamas, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, we went live like it was crazy, but uh, they're bigger fines to come. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, because my first email text to you got rejected, so my happy bucks are for Gail. Um, she was awesome. Amazing. Gail to the rescue, that's great. Does anyone else? Bill? Yeah, I have a happy five. Um, because of COVID, uh, daughter Emily has been, uh, she's supposed to be away in school for two years in Scotland, and fortunately she spent uh, the whole summer and right up until December at the cottage and, and doing online learning there, so we got to see her uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Dave Minx for covering for me for bingo. Amazing. Nice. 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 Jamie Tritt. I've got a happy five. Uh, family's all good and they're back studying and stuff like that, but um, mostly it's for, uh, I know during this time a lot of businesses have been uh, down. Uh, our food services obviously in, in the town are having issues as well. Um, I am, I've got to be in one of the only industries that's flourished during this time and we have just been so thankful for the success and being able to still be uh, up and running and flourishing. So thank you. Amazing. That's great. Anybody else? I'm really happy. I'll put a happy 10 in later, but I'm super happy that John and Andrea are here. They're two of my dearest friends. Um, it's great to see them. It's great to see everybody here. Thank you so much for coming. We are videoing, so anyone that's coming up, we are videoing this, and we will post it up on YouTube for anyone that wants to share um, John's words. Uh, maybe they want to share this meeting with people. Feel free to do that as well. Uh, is there any other announcements that I'm forgetting? Is there anything that people... No, we're good? Okay, I'm just going to take a short break and then I'll intro John and we will get this started. Thank you. Thanks for that tip. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Johnny Waite. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I met Johnny when I was in my 20s and I can say that he definitely changed the trajectory of my life um, just in terms of you know what I thought was possible for myself. And I definitely wouldn't be here in front of all of you doing speaking if it wasn't for meeting John, so I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, beyond that, uh, he is a dad, he is a husband, he is the ultimate adventure seeker, he is a dream life curator, a life coach, a motivational speaker, he has too many certifications to list in this brief intro. 
He has been to 20 plus countries, five continents, climbed the highest mountain in South America, and he is incredibly generous and surprisingly very humble. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome Johnny Wade to speak to you today. Thank you. I was kind of grateful Amanda said that I didn't send her a bio. I said I did, but she hadn't seen it. And I said, actually, it's great. Don't read the bio that I sent, because I always hate when it's very clear that you're reading a bio that the person sent, and then they get up and talk about how humble they are by it. They didn't expect such nice words. So Amanda really did make that one up, so I am humbled by that. Thank you for those very nice words. Um, so this is great. I'm really grateful for this. When Amanda called and asked if I could come over and speak, I was quite looking forward to it, because I haven't done much of this in a long time. And it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, about PPP, I'll come to that in a couple minutes, we talk a lot about PPE right now, personal protective equipment. Um, I have three things I want to come back to, three P's that I'm going to sort of meditate on with this, but um, it's, it's really more to tell you about a 10 year adventure that brings me to today that starts 10 years ago. And uh, 10 years ago from right now, I, I was thinking about this actually on my way and I was living in um, my office, which was illegal, I wasn't supposed to be living there but I didn't have a home, so I was living in my office. And uh, I had just gone through a bit of a, a complete reset where um, I'd had a successful real estate career in Aurelia, and I uh, gave that up to uh, pursue politics. And some of you may or may not recognize my name from back in 2008. I was running against my good friend Bruce Stanton for uh, MP. Uh, I was gonna follow in Paul Devler's footsteps, and those are two people I admire a lot. I just think Paul is one of the greatest people, and I think Bruce Stanton's one of the greatest people. And in hindsight, what felt like a big disaster because uh, um, the year that I ran, we didn't end up having an election. There was the, the always about to be tomorrow minority government. And by the end of the year, I had no money and no energy and no desire to be the MP anymore. And, uh, and in hindsight, that was a bullet dodge, not just for me, but for all of you. <laughs> I would have been a terrible MP and Bruce is a great MP. So uh, in hindsight, I'm pretty grateful for that. But at the time, I was doing a total life reset. I uh, had a very solid real estate career. Everything was on track, and it kind of all of a sudden was all upside down. A lot of things had changed. I wasn't married anymore. I didn't have my home anymore. Um, I didn't quite know where I was going to go next. I had recently, um, I'd been coaching realtors, so I already had some coaching experience. I decided to branch that over into more of a life coaching model, and had taken some hypnosis courses and was starting to build a practice around that. But I didn't really know what it was all going to amount to. And along the way, right around then, I decided um, I was going to go run the marathon in Toronto. I hadn't run since uh, high school, grade nine, cross country. And I think it was a bit of self-flagellation, you know, <laughs> that sort of pants around, whipping myself the whole way. But um, went down and, and found I quite enjoyed that kind of suffering. And uh, then the next year, 2010, so 10 years ago from right now, I stumbled on a thing called Spartan Race. And Spartan Race is one of the obstacle races, the running, dragging, throwing, climbing, clicking, screaming. And um, I went and did the first one of those in Quebec. And it, it, it was really great. I had no expectations, didn't know um, if I'd get good at it. Finished and was really thrilled with the experience. But that's where the real adventure started because I, it got me onto a mailing list for a thing called the Death Race, and the Death Race is a whole other level of crazy. This is something that I went down and did in 2011 in Vermont, and um, it was like a multi-day, 45-hour, non-stop, no sleep, uh, you have no idea what you're up against kind of adventure. And it really was the start of my first P, which is the whole idea of possibility. Um, it just opened my eyes to holy jumping, like what we're capable of. You know, the thought of running a marathon, it seemed like the pinnacle of human performance to me. And uh, and then going and doing this obstacle race, which seemed just the craziest thing I'd ever done. And in hindsight, it was a five kilometer, 45 minute race in, in um, Quebec. But all of a sudden I was out doing this 45 hour race where you're covering like 90 miles and you're carrying 120 pounds the whole time. You've got this pack and a giant log and you're going through the night and the rain. And, and it just, was all of a sudden, it just opened this whole massive world up to me that I had no idea existed. And so um, I, I jotted down some notes that I was thinking, so um, 2010 I did, um, uh, was when I registered for the death race. I, I got the, the memo in the fall saying, you did great in this thing in the summer, do you want to do this thing? And I, I signed up and then had from then until 2011 to try and figure out a way to get out of it. 
<laughs> which a lot of people did actually. There were 255 people signed up and only 155 people showed up. And I, I joke that uh, between sprained ankles and dead grandmothers, it was just a terrible year for, <laughs> for everybody. Because it seemed like a lot of grandmothers died or were dying right before that and they just couldn't get down. But um, so 2011 was, was that death race. And then I remember after that, my dad saying, well, glad you got that out of your system. I said, no, I think I've actually just found a good outlet for some of this energy that I need to get out. And so in 2012, I went back and I actually ended up doing three death races that year. I did um, the winter death race, um, which I did, I, I should mention, by the way, they've all got about a 10% finishing rate. So the one in um, 2011, there were 255 people signed up and there were 30 who finished. And I was fortunate to be one of those 30. So when I went back in the winter, of 2012, it was the same kind of thing, but in February in Vermont, and you're in out of a river, and and it was crazy. Anyway, I ended up finishing fifth in that one, so I suddenly thought, man, I'm actually pretty good at this. So summer 2012, um, got contacted by McLean's Magazine and by CTV, and they wanted to send a film crew down, and I'm really glad, in hindsight, that I had the sense to say, why don't you cover all the Canadians instead of just me, because I did not finish the summer of 2012, and Anyone who's seen the documentary, it's the one of all these races I've ever done, the only one I didn't finish, and they had a national film group follow me and chronicle my defeat. Um, but then went back that fall and did the first team death race, which I actually won with a couple of other uh, uh, elderly uh, racers. Because um, I hadn't done any of this until I, I turned 41, uh, when just, after, or just before I did that first marathon. So like I say, there was no history of any of this. Um, but 2012, the one that I failed at, it was really interesting, the, the, the producer of the race, the director of the race, who's gone on to become a very good friend of mine, um, I think he'd say I've gone on to become a good friend of his, but uh, he, um, he called me after the race and asked me to do some writing on it. There's a little bit of a controversy on something where some of the guys who hadn't finished thought they should have. And, and so I did some writing for him and he really liked that. And um, so he started getting me to do some other writing for Spartan, this fledgling company at the time. and. So I like to think that it was actually the race that I failed that opened up a huge door because in the fall of 2012, and by then I just started getting this coaching practice up and going and everything was going pretty well, but I got a call and they said, hey, Spartan's about to go really big. Like it's in four countries right now, we're gonna be global, but we need somebody to be our international quality manager. Would you do that? And I said, sure, of course I will. I think it was gonna be a part-time gig where I just, you know, every so often maybe go to another country and help out with the race. And it turned into a full-time gig very, very fast because we went from three countries or four countries to 14 countries to 45 countries to 50 countries now. And um, so from 2013, 14, and 15, I just traveled all over the world putting on races in all these countries. And originally it was supposed to be quality management, but the, the level of um, expertise and experience in the different countries was very, very low, obviously. The U.S. was sort of driving this, but when you went to Slovakia and they were putting on a race with, you know, different standards and um, uh, resources and things like that, you ended up leaning in and, and directing the race. So it, the role became international race director, where you'd go and work with the local people, but you were putting on these races. And so 2013, 14, and 15. I literally just went around the world. When I say around the world, like sometimes I'd fly from here to the UK and then they'd say, hey, we need you to go do something in France. And I'd be in France and they'd say, okay, now we need you to go to um, Singapore. And while you're in Singapore, can you go meet these people in Malaysia and help them scout? And then we need you in Japan. And then suddenly you come back into Toronto from the other direction and think, wow, I just went around the world again. This is really cool. Um, and and so along, along the way with that, my, my second P is all about pivoting. And I learned how good you need to be at pivoting in this job, but how much it benefits me in life too. The idea that the experience I've had with having to solve problems on the fly, and then you come back to your day to day and realize, oh, it's the exact same stuff here. Just like back in 2010, when I had to pivot from being a successful realtor to an unsuccessful politician <laughs> to what comes next. Um, so, and in a minute, I'll just tell a couple of quick stories about that. but. So that took me through to 2015. And 2015, I was kind of tired. I'd just been traveling, traveling, traveling. It was great. My kids got to come do some cool things with me. They brought them to Hawaii with me and brought them to Nicaragua with me. And, and, um, but I kind of needed to get a little bit more settled. Unfortunately, right around that, I met Andrea, who um, she has a beautiful resort. A lot of people have heard of Bonnie View Inn. It's over in Halliburton. And she started working there when she was 19, bought it when she was 29. 
and is in the process of selling it when she's not quite 49. <laughs> but um, but so for her 30 year adventure, it's been a lot of pivoting and a lot of persistence, a lot of these things, but in one place in Halliburton. So um, 2015 was, was crazy. So we met in February and um, in 2015, it had really branched out into other things beyond just uh, race directing. Um, I went down and did a paddleboard race in Tennessee that she's been down to since called uh, uh, Chattajack. Um, oh, we started doing this podcast for Spartan that's taken us all over the world doing that as well. Um, went down and ran an ultra marathon in the Copper Canyon that's uh, from the book Born to Run, very famous. And, uh, but what, and I brought my mom because she doesn't really love all this death race stuff because it's a little bit extreme. So I said, you should just come and just see this ultra marathon. It's just running. It's 80 kilometers. It's in the desert. You'll love it. You know, beautiful uh, indigenous cultures. You should come. And of course, it was the year that there was uh, narco gang violence and they had to cancel the race and airlift us out of a massive international <laughs> emergency. And uh, so my family has forbidden me from taking my parents on any more adventures. But, um, but it was really, uh, and then we ended that year, uh, Andrew came down and we, we climbed Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in South America. So it was a really great adventure year. But the cool thing with that is none of those things were on my radar before this race travel came up. And so one thing I've learned is when you say yes to one thing, you have no idea what else you're saying yes to. And that I kind of talk about um, yes being the gas and no being the brakes. And of course you do have to touch the brakes now and then, but if you jump in the car and just sit on the brakes, you're not gonna go anywhere. Whereas if you start saying yes to this and see where it takes you, and then yes to this and see where it takes you, um, you can end up in the highest mountain in South America getting engaged, which was pretty cool. And then we got married and we got back out to the bottom. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to do a real quick from there forward. So 2016, decided I'm going to take the year off, all this travel, stayed upon me with Andrea, uh, rebooted my coaching. Uh, 2017, got contacted to try and help them find a race director for Canada. Um, I never did find one, so I just ended up doing it 2017, 18, 19, so zipping back and forth across Canada. But during that time, um, we were doing this podcast, and Andrea um, had come down one time just to meet the people I was doing this podcast with, and the production assistant didn't show up. And she said, well, maybe I can help and did such a great job that we've never hired a production assistant again, and she's come all over them. So we've been with that to Iceland, to uh, Switzerland, to France, to all over the U.S., and meeting incredible people. Like we've interviewed Richard Branson and um, uh, Gabby Reese, uh, the world's greatest volleyball player, and um, it just, it, it's been this incredible experience. So again, the idea of what's possible, like the idea that this kid from Rio is gonna be meeting and talking to all these people and bringing those experiences back, 10 years ago just didn't even exist. And um, the the other one is perspective. So so I talked about possibility that there's you know, we're just capable of so much more than we could ever imagine. You know, if, if you have to do something, you'll get it done. You really will. Pivoting, the idea that sometimes you're gonna have to switch along the way. Um, so I know I need to get there. Maybe this isn't gonna get me there, maybe I need to go that way, maybe I need to do something different to get there, but there's always a way to get it done. But the last one is perspective, and the idea that um, when I've been racing, I, I came up with a, uh, an idea and it said it's gonna be Tuesday anyway. No matter how bad it gets out here, it's gonna be Tuesday. And I, I came up with that because the races I do usually start on Thursday, Friday, and they usually end on Monday. And so, no matter what, it's gonna be Tuesday. So I use that as a motivation thing for a while, the idea that you're thinking about quitting and it's Sunday night, don't be an idiot because Tuesday you're going to have to tell somebody about this and you want to tell them why you quit or how you got finished. But I also realized it from the standpoint that when you fail, it's still going to be Tuesday anyway. And this thing that felt like this massive failure at the time, whether it was the abandoned political <laughs> aspirations or whether it was the race that you didn't finish with the film crew following you, by Tuesday it's not going to matter that much. And by Wednesday, September the 9th, 10th, when you're in Midland telling stories about it, it's actually going to be great fodder for <laughs> an entertaining audience with. This thing that at the time seems so embarrassing and terrible. Um, but I've also seen it um, on a pretty massive scale too because organizing these races when you've got you know thousands of people competing um, on a race in a volcano in Mexico or in Hawaii or whatever, and you have somebody have a heart attack on the back of the mountain, and suddenly you know, being really worried that the cups arrived and they weren't the right color and you were going to fire somebody because they didn't get the right color cups, but now somebody's having a heart attack on the back of the mountain that you have to manage. Um, it really helps you recognize what matters and what doesn't. And we've never not been able to pull off a race. And there have been times where I've literally, one of the best ones ever was um, I got a call on a Monday. And so 
usually our build cycle is two weeks to build a race. And I got a call on a Monday saying there's something really going wrong in Mexico. You need to get down there and see. We're not hearing back from the licensee. Um, we talked to the venue. They haven't heard from them. So I flew in on Tuesday to find out that the licensee had just kind of skipped town but sold all these race registrations and thousands of people were coming on the Saturday to this race that we didn't have anything done for and nobody could find the licensee. So I jumped on the phone and by Wednesday had friends from all over the world who had flown in to help pull this off and Thursday, Friday we built a race that we got off Saturday. Wow. <laughs> so that's the pivot and the possible. But I did realize that if the worst case never happened and we didn't get that race off and it felt like such a terrible thing, I'd still be here today telling you what this great story about the time we didn't get a race done. So it just has given me that ability to look back 10 years and realize that all those things that somewhere along the way seem like the worst thing ever, for the most part they're not. They're just another cool step in a journey that someday you're going back and, and have some fond memories about. Um, but I just I want to wrap up with a, a 10 year back thought that ties back to right in today. So the other thing that happened 10 years ago is I, uh, I created a vision board and I also I just bought a sailboat and so I'd always always wanted a boat like a kind of a live-on sailboat that I could have and at the time my kids were I think 20 or sorry they weren't they were 11 and 13 and I had gone and bought this sailboat and I was going to surprise them with it and it was just in hindsight it was a bit of mania I mean the idea that these kids are going to love this forced fun of getting on dad's boat and uh, and I came to my senses, called the owners and said, look, I, I, if you can resell it, I'd love my deposit back. If you can't keep the deposit, it's my bad. They were very gracious and they did resell it and gave me the deposit back. Um, but 10 years later, we just uh, sailed our boat from Collingwood, not that boat, a different boat, um, sailed our boat from Collingwood over to White Heritage. So when Amanda called to ask if we wanted to speak, or if I wanted to speak, um, we didn't have to drive far because we're spending a bunch of time right now over at White Heritage Marina. We're kind of Midlanders now. And, uh, but the cool thing with that is that 10 years ago, that was a dream that I remember at the time sort of abandoning that's come to total fruition and it's a better boat than we ever imagined back then. We're so excited about it. Slept on it last night where it's, 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 our, it's our cottage. Um, but there were a bunch of other things around that board at the time that didn't seem super possible. So I'm sleeping in my office. So I just have to actually paint this picture for you. Um, in Aurelia, uh, sort of the Mariposa corner, um, it used to be a tattoo shop underneath, and I think it's a pot shop now. <laughs> but above it, there's a yoga studio and, um, and this little office that nobody had ever used because it was too small. It was maybe four feet wide by eight feet long, but it had a safe in it. It was the old safe from the bank way back when, and the safe was about six feet long, seven feet long, by about three feet wide. So I actually turned the safe into my bedroom. I, I blew up a mattress and I slept, <laughs> I slept on the safe. And so just keep in mind that when I'm writing this vision board of all these things I want to do, I'm sleeping in a bank safe that I'm not allowed to be in. And, and washing my face in, the, uh, in, the, in the, the public sink. Anyway, but at the time, um, I just created this vision board and it had um, uh, climbing a mountain. And I just picked a picture of a mountain. It turned out to be the exact mountain that I ended up climbing years later. Uh, having a sailboat, we have the sailboat over at White Heritage. It's a better sailboat than I imagined back then. Um, for some reason, I put Australia on there. I'd never been to Australia. I think I've been to Australia eight times since. Um, every single thing that I put on there has happened. And so it's kind of that you want to be careful what you wish for because it's probably going to happen if you wish hard enough. And um, so now we're going to have some fun. Andrew and I, we're going to actually create our vision board now because she's been a Bonnie Bee for all these years and has had some amazing adventures of her own, but has brought on a business partner for the first time in 30 years. She can actually breathe and go, Okay, there's, there's more out there again. So, um, yeah, so we'll be planning our next 10 years. So if you could get out your phones and put down September 10th, 2030, I'm going to be back. <laughs> and I uh, will tell you all what's happened in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years after that. So thanks all very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I, one thing I didn't do at all, and I'm not going to because I've used up all my time, but like a any one of those points along there, I can tell you a story about um, getting a call, sort of like the one in Mexico where it was to fly over to Portugal to put on an event that had to be a, like in a day. And I, I can just tell these like ridiculous stories about the things that have happened in the races and the experiences and, and the things along the way. So it was really, really easy when I had one, when I came to talk about the death race, because I could talk for 20 minutes about this one experience and get all the details. And now I just talk about this 
overriding picture of all this stuff, but if, if anyone has any questions about any of that stuff in specific, feel free to come over and ask me after and I'll tell you all about it, so thanks. Amanda says I have time for questions if anyone has a question. <laughs> She's good, eh? That was really self-serving. No, that's good. Um, so you do a lot of coaching, and yeah. I just want to know what you think the number one thing is building people back from living Cool. Um, great question. So she asked about um, the coaching that I do, and uh, and what I think is the number one thing that's holding people back from from going after their, their dreams. And I I I always say that the coach that I give people is um, that I bring three things to the table. It's um, uh, strategy, accountability, and encouragement, because I think those are the important things. And I think a lack of accountability is a big thing for us, because we say we'll do something, but it doesn't really matter if we do or we don't. Except what actually matters is we don't get the life that we want but there's not an immediate consequence. So I think a big part of it is just putting it out there. Like when you tell somebody you're gonna do something and make it public and then there's a little bit of pressure on you to do it, it's a good thing to do to, to put that out in the world so that there has to be that. Um, and I tell my clients that, so that's what I'm doing. I'm helping them with strategy, accountability, encouragement. But for them, it all boils down to where they're spending their time and what conversations are they or aren't they having. And that's it, that's life right there. Because when somebody tells me what's really important to me is I want to do this, I say, awesome. Tell me what you did last night. Well, I watched re reruns of whatever. What did you think before that? I mowed the lawn. Like, these are all valid things, but how many of those led to that thing you say that you really want? So where are you spending the time? But more often than not, it's actually a conversation that they are or aren't having. And the conversations we don't have are huge. The conversations with our family, with our employers, with our employees, with our friends, um, and the quality of the conversation. So if you start thinking about what are the things that I want in life, who do I need to have a conversation with about that, and why am I not having that conversation? And so that's a huge aspect of the coaching that I do is helping people to figure out how to have those difficult conversations, and then to take what comes out of it and decide what the actions are going to take on that. So I promise you that if you're stuck somewhere in your life, there's probably a conversation that you're not having with someone. And that if you would look at that conversation, it make a big difference. Thank you. Great question. Yes? Tony, on the, uh, you know, the, the male side of things, yeah. I've always been engaged, right? And uh, what, what are you seeing with respect to the female gender and the engagement in sports activity? Oh, yeah. What are, you, what are you noticing in the last 10 years, 15 years? Sure. Well, in, in this sport in particular, this sort of extreme endurance stuff, um, it does have this macho feel at the start, like when I was first doing it, it was a lot more guys than, than gals, um, and yet it's really flip-flopped, um, especially endurance. Um, uh, the ultra marathon distance, like the 100 mile type races, and that's a whole other part of this world that I have dove really deep into and I'm really enjoying. Um, women are beating men outright in long distance races, and not just, um, you know, um, scaled or age group or anything else. Like, a 40-year-old woman will go out and beat a 20-year-old guy, not in every race, but in lots of races, head-to-head, -head, and it's awesome. And the and the balance that it brings to the experience is awesome. Like, when I'm, when I'm at these kind of races, it's not like these are the guys and these are the gals, these are just all the racers. And so I, th I think that's huge, um, that there's that opportunity. And then the other thing that's really cool, again, again from an endurance standpoint, is that I promise there's no one here that is going to go out and set a, uh, a record for the 100 meter dash because we just don't have the fast twitch muscles anymore. But anyone here could go out and become a great ultra runner because that slow twitch, just left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, um, you can keep doing pretty much at any age. And if you haven't been a runner in the past, it's actually advantageous because you haven't worn out the parts that you need to be able to do it now. Um, there's a great story about a guy when I was doing the, uh, the Halliburton 100. In, in, in the Halliburton Forest, um, and it was just after that first death race in 2011, so my first 100 mile race was a couple weeks after that. And uh, I, I'd broken my foot, and I, I actually broke it in the death race and just kept going by tightening my shoes up, tightening my shoes up, and this time that wasn't gonna work. So I was hobbling to the next aid station, and I was just trying to get there, and I heard the shuffle behind me. It's a shuffle that I now hear when I run, and it's the old man shuffle when it's like. So you know, the feet aren't coming up very high, but it's like that. And I turned and I saw what looked like Santa Claus behind me. And it was a guy, his name is Joe Cleary. He goes by Irish Joe. He's from down Burlington way, I think. Big white beard. I'd never met him before. And he was coming up behind me and he said, 
Hi, he said, uh, you look like you're in trouble, son. I said, yeah, I've broken my foot. I'm just going to get to the next aid station. My day's done. And I said, where are you at? And what I meant was where are you at mentally, physically, you know, how are you doing? And it was awesome. The timing was great. He took one more step and he said, I'm going to try and do the Irish accent. I'm going to screw up. And he went, where am I at? Bye, I'm one stride in front of you in a hundred mile race. <laughs> And he just kept going, and I tucked in behind him, and I thought, oh, if I can keep up with this guy, he'll get me to the aid station. Um, but I've always remembered that, and, and I love, love, love being in a race and seeing somebody who's 70, 80, 85 running, and they're not moving fast, but they're running, and they're getting it done. Um, what I didn't know if I'd love or not, but I found out a little while ago, was when somebody pats me on the shoulders, they go, I go, sir, you're an inspiration. <laughs> And I said, I'm that guy now. I'm, I'm the way here guy that's inspiring these 30-year-olds out there. Uh, but I'll take it. I'll take that. So, yeah, so but back to the original question about, about gender. Um, and I expanded out to age as well. Uh, it is a very inclusive sport. And um, I interviewed the other day a woman from Australia, Deanna Blake. Uh, really incredible. So she is somebody who is, uh, she was actually just on that, I think it's called the World's Toughest Race or whatever the, the Eco Challenge is on Amazon right now. Um, so, and there was actually a great Canadian named Ryan Atkins, his team finished second in that. If you're, if you're watching the series, I hope I didn't just blow up because he finished second, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but but uh, Deanna um, is a 51-year-old woman from Australia who's one of the top adventure racers in the world, who at 20 was in a car accident and in the blood transfusion contracted HIV. And so for 30 plus years, she's managed HIV um, and competed at a very high level in a sport that used to be very male-dominated. And one of my favorite pictures um, from a thing called the World's Toughest Mud or another uh, huge obstacle race, 24-hour um, event, that was in uh, Las Vegas at the time, but at night it gets extremely cold there, is a picture of her with a bungee attached to her pulling her male teammate who's slower, and it's an adventure racing trick that you bungee. And so she's moving forward and it's helping him move forward, but I love that that gender equalizing picture. It wasn't him pulling her forward, it was her pulling him forward. He was about 20 years younger and the male. So that's the answer is that the women are actually dominating it. So cool. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I have a little gift for you in my car and a card. So thank you. Um, is there anything else in the interest of Rotary? Any even questions, concerns? We're good. Next meeting. Uh, the next meeting will not be next week. It'll be the week after. So we're going to do the Bowden, hopefully this week. Fingers crossed the weather works for us. Um, and then we will be doing one the week after. It will be at the Legion. They've graciously allowed us to continue to have this space for as long as we need it. And obviously that's, you know, assuming that things don't go back to lockdown or things like that so fingers crossed two weeks from today we will be meeting in this exact location um, you can leave out the back door that way if you desire um, and if you have any questions oh yeah I was just gonna say what uh like going forward, are we going to plan like a bi-weekly type meeting? Is yes, so my goal um, for the meetings is going to be week one, regular meeting. Week two, I have to talk to Christine, community service, but she has, or club service, she has decided to do an event every month, which I think is fantastic. I, I'm really looking forward to that, so hopefully she can do hers on week two. Week three, we will have another regular meeting. Week four will be a board meeting, and then week five will be a break. Um, if things change and go back to the way they were, we'll probably go back to bi-weekly Zoom meetings, but hopefully we can continue this schedule moving forward. But that's all hinging on Christine and, and if she can find venues to host us for events too. So, And if anyone has any you know, ideas, thoughts, feel free to come and talk to me after the meeting outside. That would be great. Have a lovely day. There's, Nothing else in the interest of Rotary, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thanks,